Okay, let us talk about the BIPs project. And just to refresh everyone's memory, the BIPs project consisted of 15 actions by the OECD. It was a two and a half to three year project in which it determined how to fix the international tax system. And basically the BEPS project can be divided into two major components. The first is a basis where what they've done in these two actions apply across the board to everything. And then they had three basic pillars where they said, you know, we must fix the coherence of the international tax system so that things do not contradict each other anymore. We must fix the requirement for substance in international tax so that you can't just put, let, put up letterbox companies everywhere. And we must have transparency. We can't have taxpayers telling A to country A and B to country B, which is completely contradictory to what I just said to country A. Okay. And then they had the 15 action points within these two boxes. The first action point was a digital economy. And the question was, do we treat the digital economy different than the other economies? And the answer was basically no. The digital economy is the mainstream economy and to have separate rules for it would be silly. And they came with certain recommendations which were followed up later after BEPS and these apply both for direct taxes like income tax and indirect taxes such as VAT. The next action point was hybrid mismatch arrangements where as I said, you know, if we want to fix the coherence of the system, we need to make sure that things are qualified the same everywhere and we need to stop having instruments for instance or rules which allow a country to give money to another a company to give money to another company where the one country says oh but this is debt and the other country says this is equity where in the end you get an interest deduction in country debtor but you don't get a pickup for that interest income in country creditor because country creditor exempts this as a tax-free dividend. There was action three dealing with CFC rules where they basically said these are the different ways in which you can have CFC rules to stop companies from setting up subsidiaries and tax havens and defer the taxation of the income of those tax havens forever. Action four dealt with interest deductions. And they said, you know, we need to make sure that companies don't erode countries' tax bases by just pumping a huge amount of debt into their high tax subsidiaries. And these are the choices that you have of how you can stop that from happening. And then finally, to action five dealt with harmful tax practices. And they said, you know, countries need to stop competing with each other on taxes in a way where one country tries to harm the interest of another one. So therefore, for instance, if you give tax rulings which affect the tax base of another country, you should exchange those rulings with them um, and, 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 and just become more transparent and, and, and don't break the coherence of the international tax system, but fix it. The next set of action points dealt with substance. And the first one was to stop treaty shopping. Right. And this was done basically through a principal purpose test, like we discussed under the UN uh, commentaries um, before, and, um, <clears throat> and, 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 and and the limitation on benefits test. Also by changing the heading of the treaty by, and saying very clearly, listen, the treaty is both there to stop double tax, but also double non-tax, right? The next action point dealt with PE status and they tried to stop companies from avoiding having PEs in different countries, for instance, through commissionaire structures. We'll deal with those later when we talk about PEs in this course. Action eight dealt with the TP aspects of intangibles. And this is this whole long chapter that I just referred to in the transfer pricing guidelines, the new chapter, which was developed. Nine dealt with capital and risk. And basically the concern there was that you would put a lot of equity into tax haven companies and then say, you know what, actually all my money should go to the tax haven company because look how much money they have put into any project. They're carrying all the risk. And then Action 10 dealt with high risk transactions. And again, dealing with how do we reduce from a tax authority's point of view, the tax revenue risks associated with these transactions. Eight to 10 are TP driven BEPS actions and we will deal with them as we go through the transfer pricing guidelines because they're basically all found uh, 
their solutions in the transfer pricing guidelines. Then the third pillar finally to deal with in BEPS was transparency. The first one is not really important for taxpayers in the sense that it is telling the OECD and governments how to analyze BEPS, how to try and quantify BEPS, huh, the base erosion and profit shifting activities of taxpayers so that we know how big the problem is that we deal with. Action 12 was very much the counterweight of Action 5, whereas in Action 5, countries had to tell each other what they do in terms of, of special tax facilities and structures and tax deals. Action 12 tells taxpayers that they have to tell all the special tax deals and structures and plans that they do. So any aggressive tax planning tools, for instance, Action 12 suggests to governments what they can do to make both the taxpayers and the banks and the consultants of the taxpayers and the bank disclose these rules. They don't say you can't do them because typically they are not illegal. They just, countries believe in, 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 in contradiction with the spirit of the law. So when you do these things, they're legal, you can do them, but you must tell us. And obviously that takes a lot of fun out of a lot of tax planning structures for a lot of taxpayers. Action 13 again is TP related and it deals with the master file and the country files, country by country reporting and the local files that we talked about when we went through the, the chapters of the transfer pricing guidelines. Action 14 finally deals with dispute resolution and the OECD said, you know, we're not only going to try and catch taxpayers more easily, but we're also going to make sure that tax disputes get resolved, preferably more efficiently, quicker and more fairly. And as part of the, the resolving it more fairly, they suggest that we put more arbitration clauses into treaties. So if you get into a tax dispute, it can't be so that the countries can't be so that the countries there say, you know, we can't agree. You have to pay double tax. If they cannot agree, then you can take them to arbitration, and then the arbitration board has to decide which of the two countries are right: the adjusting country or the country that refuses to acknowledge the adjustment. And then finally, Action 15, which again was part of the basis package, was a multilateral instrument. And here, I mean, you can see there's a lot of actions that concern treaties. And countries were concerned that if they have to make all these changes, the BEPS changes, in the treaties on a bilateral basis, it would take forever because your typical treaty negotiation process can be anything from two years to, in the case of Holland and the US, 20 years. And if you've got 3,000 treaties worldwide to change between countries, with countries having anything from one treaty to maybe 120 treaties, I believe, that the UK has, this can take forever. Instead of going that way, the OECD developed a multilateral instrument where they said if all the countries agree between these different BEPS action points, which solution they want to choose, and typically they can choose one of two or three or four alternatives, then they can simply sign this thing with each other, and then all of a sudden by signing one treaty, the MLI, the multilateral instrument, you sign the treaty with everyone else who signed already and you change your treaties automatically. So, so if 10 countries have signed the MLI with each other and they each had the treaty with every other country, then instead of um, changing one treaty, they change 100 treaties. And one has to say that the MLI was probably one of the practical biggest successes of the BEPS project. Okay, so let us look at BEPS actions 8 to 10 and then to 13. This is the final report, the way it looked like. And as you can see from the table of contents, it deals with the following topics, right? First of all, it gives guidance to the arm's length principle and how you apply it. And it changed chapter 1 quite significantly um, in the sense that, first of all, it, it, it replaced several paragraphs regarding what we used to call a functional analysis by saying, no, we're now talking about identifying the commercial and financial relations between the parties. And they very much focused on risk. You've got to be clear who's carrying the risk and the party that you say that carries the risk, A, must be able to control that risk and B, must have the financial capacity to bear the risk. They didn't say that you're not allowed to outsource the risk control, but when you do that, you should be able to control the outsourcing. In other words, you should be able to judge 
whether the person that you outsource to or the company that you outsource to is capable of doing so and replace that company if they don't do what you think they should be doing. And secondly, chapter one, the rewritten chapter one, deals with accurately, de um, with accurately delineating the transactions. Um, and then this was a bit of a sneaky one in the sense that in the old guidelines, if they didn't believe the transaction was right, they could recharacterize the, the transaction and say, no, 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 you call this a loan, but this is actually equity for a number of reasons. Now they're not recharacterizing it anymore. They're accurately delineating it. And then as a second step, they can disregard a transaction if it doesn't make commercial sense. We will get to that when going through the guidelines. They also addressed an issue with commodities. Because taxpayers used to say, well, commodities are your perfect cups because the newspapers are full of the right prices. And lo and behold, in intercompany transactions, when they recorded the transactions, they always managed to pick the prices at such a way that they could sell very high to low uh, to do very high to high tax jurisdictions and very low to low tax jurisdictions. Um, and, and and what the guidelines now say is, you know, if you you cannot do choose these pricings afterwards based on what suits your tax outcome the best. You need to be able to, to, to reliably demonstrate when you have picked the right price at the time when you pick the right price. And if you, and if you can't convince the tax authorities that they've done that you've done that, then they simply will use, for instance, the shipment date of the commodity as the pricing date, and not the one that you say is the pricing date. Right? The other chapters that they've dealt with as they've added some stuff to chapter two and when dealing with the five methods we will get there um, they also dealt with the or they haven't dealt with i should say the scope of the transactional profit split method um, during beps and, and and also in the years before that i mean the profit split method became a lot more attractive for a lot of especially developing countries tax authorities and the OECD is going along with that, but they're still working on guidance for the transactional profit split method. They've issued some questions to Republic. They've discussed those uh, the, 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 those questions in public, um, and now they need to come with the final guidance. But that project is not quite done yet. Intangibles, as we said before, has been a very big part of BEPS, and it's a very big chapter now in the transfer pricing guidelines. We'll deal with it in more detail when we get there, but the underlying message is the fact that you're the legal owner doesn't mean they get all the income. You can get all the royalties, for instance, of the license that you've written, but if you don't control the asset which generate those royalties, then you need to pay those royalties that you've received basically to the companies that perform all those controls. And you only get a, maybe a low risk routine as an investor, depending on how much of that risk you control as an investor. The other chapters dealt with low value adding intergroup services. I've discussed this when we went through the transfer pricing guideline chapters and we look again at it when we deal with that chapter and the cost contribution arrangements. Again, it's something that we'll deal with when we get to that chapter. So let us have a look at action 13. So here is the final report on action 13. And here is the table of contents. And as I discussed when I talked about chapter five of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, we now have the objectives of transfer pricing documentation, which basically is that the taxpayer should show that he thought about his own transfer pricing policies, that it allows the tax authorities to make a risk assessment of which companies they want to order for transfer pricing and which not, and it should give a very first um, information for the tax authorities in dealing with the audit, right? And then it does this three-tier system where you've got a master file which talks about the group, the group policies, the major group products. Um, you've got the local file which goes into more detail of all the transactions with the local entity and the other group companies. And then the country by country report, which is basically a, a three-page, if you want, summary of um, where all the group entities are situated and what they're doing one out of eight categories i believe of, of activities such as manufacturing or sales or holding company or finance company or r d 
um, the numbers on a country basis of uh, the equity that you have, the assets that you have, the number of employees that you have, the internal and the external turnover that you have, the tax that you've paid and profit before tax that you realized, and then guidance more for governments of um, how to exchange these reports with each other. So that covers action 13 and we'll deal with it again when we get to chapter 5.